Well, good afternoon. Am I on? Hey, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Blake Teipel. I'm the president and CTO at Ascentium Materials, uh, also at Trifusion Devices. We're here today to talk about what does functional FDM look like? What is, is it possible to achieve isotropic strength, dramatically improved mechanical performance using FDM additive? Well, we think the answer is yes, and we're about to show you how. So I'm going to talk to a little bit today about the problem that has faced FDM ever since its inception and how we are fundamentally rewriting the physics equation inside the printer for the first time in 30 years. Let's start out with a little bit of our worldview. Why do we think FDM is a relevant technology? For a long time, people thought, well, FDM is just sort of relegated to prototypes or it's just sort of this technology that's useful if you want to print a toy or a trinket or something that is fun to play with. Well, we actually think that FDM is a very compelling manufacturing technology, and I'll show you a little bit about why we think that is. First of all, let's talk about the problem. We've ranked a series of metrics, mechanical metrics and functional metrics that our industrial users care about. Starting with uniformity, going on down through a few more, we've, we've started and we've looked at FDM, SLS, and SLA. Now, to be sure, there are a variety of other manufacturing technologies we've seen uh, here today and, and at other times, but so for some of the big ones, this is what we've looked at. So FDM traditionally has been poor in, in performance for uniform part production. However, access to functional materials is very, very broad and promising across a wide range of thermoplastic, elastic, and composite materials in ways that are dramatically larger and more interesting with FDM than other technologies. So we can actually make stronger parts with FDM composites if we could just make those parts more uniformly. Resolution, multimodal materials, build speed, and print size have also been considered here. One of the things I want to highlight also with FDM is multimodal materials. We're talking about materials with a wide range of mechanical properties. We're also discussing materials with a wide range of electrical properties, dielectric pro uh, constants that can be tuned as a function of material type within the print. That's an area where FDM really shines. And finally, FDM is a technology which is highly scalable. We can make parts that are tiny, or we can 3D print cars. That's how broadly the FDM technology pack can be applied to today's industrial and medical uses. So for us, We've been working for the last couple of years on addressing this pesky problem of interlayer delamination in this quest, this holy grail quest, if only we could achieve isotropic parts. That is to say, if the joints in between the layers of the printed parts were as strong as the plastic itself, man, that would unlock a ton of potential for FDM additive across wide ranging industrial sectors. So how is this possible? with fused filament fabrication or a fused deposition modeling type printing. I'm going to share a short video with you today that shows how this is possible. History has always been driven by invention. From the making of fire and the design of the wheel to the Gutenberg press and the collagen. From Thomas Edison's light bulb and the Wright brothers' first flight all the way to the miracle of landing on None of it could have happened without imagination, a good amount of courage, and the belief that things can be better, that nothing is impossible. The greatest inventions to transform the world didn't just happen overnight. They each suffered through thousands of failures, mistakes, and missteps. Until that one day when somehow the magic happens. Edison finds the right design of an incandescent bulb. The Wright brothers found the perfect balance to control an aircraft, and a new world of possibilities was born. Today, we stand on the cusp of the next industrial revolution, driven by the invention of 3D printing. In the world of 3D printing and manufacturing, we've got our own set of obstacles to face. 
One of them is structural strength. With 3D printing, you're laying down thousands of layers of material. Often with more complicated designs, inner layer strength just plummets. Until we solve this problem, 3D printing is doomed to remain relegated to weak prototypes and trinkets like Yoda heads and Eiffel Towers. Well, we've got some good news. We've discovered a way to combine the ease and efficiency of three-dimensional printing with the power and strength of leading-edge technology. Introducing Fusebox. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it, it looks something like this. So how's it work? Well, it's a two-step process. First, we coat the filament with a thin layer of highly conductive carbon nanomaterials. Next, using our patented flash fuse technology, we use electromagnetic waves to excite the particles in that thin layer, causing the layers to react and heat up rapidly. This heating allows the layers to weld together. So what does this mean? We now have the ability to weld an entire printed part together during the printing process, achieving up to 98% the strength of an injection molded part. No post-processing, you take the part off the printer, and it's ready. We provide a new level of strength never found in a 3D printed part before. Isotropic properties comparable to those in injection molded parts. The uses of our product are game changers for the automotive, aerospace, medical, defense, and petroleum industries, all of which depend on practical parts that must be used in production. The future is here. The possibilities are endless. So let the revolution begin. So as you can, so as you can see, our fuse box technology, that's about half the total solution. You can think of that like the way that Intel sells computer chips. You get a computer chip inside a laptop, it makes your laptop run better. You get a fuse box inside an FDM printer, it's going to make that printer run better. So again, how, how does it work in a little bit more detail? We're really addressing this delamination failure mode issue for 3D printed parts, especially under fatigue or impact loading, those parts will fail right in between the layers. This is because of poor bonding in between those plastic layers. And this has limited the applications far more narrowly than what is truly possible with the technology. So really 3D printing can be disruptive if we can fix this issue. So our, t our solution is two part. As you can see on the table over there, you basically have a hardware solution which gets plugged into the printer and then there's a material science innovation right behind it. So the material science works by making the world's first multi-layer commercial filament. We apply a thin film coating of carbon nanomaterial composite on the outside of monofilament. This keeps a highly conductive layer, electrically conductive, right at the interface in between the printed parts. And then, when the printed parts are being manufactured, we apply electricity to the printed part through the fuse box technology. This provides enough activation energy to allow the thermoplastic chains to weld across the layers. We're not curing, we're not cross-linking, we're just allowing polymer chain mobility to happen across that inner layer boundary, just like injection molding. Here's the secret. How does this work? We're actually nine orders of magnitude more electrically conductive than the next closest commercially available ESD filament. That's one billion times more conductive than the next filament that's available on the market. That's how our technology works. When you look at the fracture properties, we've in some cases improved fracture strength over that of the bulk polymer. In the blue, you've got bulk polymer. In the green, 3D printed polymer in a single layer. In the red, our local RF welding based technology. When you look at this fracture under a microscope, you can see a clean glassy failure for 3D printed parts, whereas with our plasma based process, you see a taffy type failure dramatically improving the ductility, the strain at break, and the elasticity of the overall printed part. And so, when you're done looking at your data, you just hang out for a little bit on a 3D printed chain link, 
that where you're stressing out all the layers right in between those interfaces, like some of our friends have done in the printed process. So what materials can we use with this process? Is it limited to one or two? Are there only six? No, there's hundreds. We're releasing materials all across the material spectrum. <clears throat> so we've got uh, thermoplastic urethane materials with a variety of softnesses and durometers and flame retardant values. We've got PLAs and other polyester materials, styrenics that we're considering, although really printing with styrenics, that's kind of a side conversation, but maybe it should go away. Uh, we've got polyamides, PET with glass fiber, P, uh, polycarbonates and polyamides with, with carbon fiber, and then the exotics. That's the exciting stuff, sulfonated polymers, carbon fiber filled materials, peaks and ultems. As well, so you can see high temperature materials, low temperature and mechanical properties across the spectrum. <clears throat> Our launch materials include a polyamide, it's an ultra mid from BASF, wonderful material, and we've got a high strength engineering grade PLA. So look at some of these mechanical properties that are possible. In the blue, carbon fiber infused material, you can get tremendous mechanical properties that are not possible with other types of additive, other types of polymer additive. So finally, if we can address that uniformity issue, that pesky interlayer bonding issue, we can unlock access to really strong printed parts. Good news, everyone. Essentium's flash fuse technology provides that solution. <coughs> and it's, it's fast, by the way. I should mention that. Um, we've got more data on that to share later. But. So I want to share with everyone a couple of use cases. So what have we done to look at how useful this technology is for industrial and biomedical use cases? So we had a customer come to us and say, hey, we're an automaker, and we would like to make prototype tooling in a much shorter design cycle, and it only has to last for a few shots. I don't need this thing to last thousands or tens of thousands of shots, and I don't want to make it out of aluminum because I want low cycle time, and I want this thing to be ready as quickly as possible. So we looked at this tooling application. We said our lead time improvement can be, can be a factor of five. Our cycle time improvement can be very real because we can, we can access design freedom now with 3D printed tooling, things like circulatory channel type cooling instead of just gun drills or casting cores or other technologies that have typically limited the true cooling capacity of injection mold tooling. And so you can get small run class A surface finish applications with combined additive subtractive workflow with 3D printing and 3D milling. So what we did was we printed a part. This is an eight kilogram part, 100% infill, fully dense. We put it onto a CNC mill. We machined off the top layers to achieve a class A finish. And you know what? It machined like aluminum. So the settings were really rapid, and it machined in just uh, probably less than an hour, I think, was the total machining operation here. We then put it into an insert, a 450-ton injection molding machine, Detroit, Michigan. Here's the insert you can see right in the middle of the part. And we got a whole series of prototype injection molded tools, injection molded parts, right off of this 3D printed tool. Now I'm going to talk for a minute about the biomedical case. Trifusion Devices is, a case, is, a, is an Ascentium company, and we've explored what is possible in the biomedical space if I can adopt a 3D scan to 3D print workflow and 3D print structural, prosthetic, and orthotic parts. We're not the first one to 3D print prosthetic parts here. We're not claiming to be. In fact, people have tried to 3D print prosthetic parts ever since 3D printing was introduced. But I will tell you, we're the first ones to make it strong enough and build them to last. So Trifusion fabricates and supplies finished biomedical devices to clinicians across the United States. And we're looking globally right now as well. So the way this works is you have the end user who visits the clinician. The clinician performs a very rapid 3D scan operation. An entire distal limb can be scanned in a minute and a half. The clinician then supplies the data. We supply the printed part. The clinician fits it to the patient, and then we get paid. That's how this business model works. 3D scan, 3D model, 3D print. The market in the United States for biomedical devices is actually nearly a $7 billion market, and it's growing at over 10% due to a, a myriad of diseases like vascular, diabetic neuropathy, and other pressing issues. I first thought 
that conflict, you know, soldiers coming home from overseas, that that was the main issue, but it's not. All around the world, vascular disease is on the rise, and so this market continues to grow, and it needs to be disrupted. The typical device delivery time for a prosthetic leg is multiple weeks, just like tooling and automotive or industrial use. That supply time is many, many weeks. And you can see why. It's a 26-step process to make a, th to make a prosthetic device using today's techniques. You have to use plaster casting, thermoforming, and then plaster casting again once you've figured out if the fitment from the diagnostic socket is accurate. And then you go all the way back to the beginning and you start with resin transfer molding and then cutting and chipping away of carbon fiber epoxy composites using pneumatic tools, praying the entire time you're not going to nick the surface of the inside of that epoxy part. Because if so, you have to start again. So what if you could just do this in three steps? Well, with 3D scan, 3D model, 3D print, you can. Three steps, that's all it takes. And by the way, the timing here is a minute and a half, 20 minutes to do the model, and then a few hours to make the printed part, and it's done. These devices are mechanical in nature. They have to be replaced. For adults, the average replacement rate in the US and other developed areas is three to five years. For kids, they'll need a new prosthetic device every time they need new shoes. So this is not just a one-time painful procurement process. It is a multiple lifelong procurement process. It is very painful. So we work with a software partner to do the 3D scan workflow. Standard Cyborg is a company out in California, sells software subscriptions to clinics. They've developed a 3D uh, modeling workflow that the clinician engages with. Again, clinicians have to be in the loop. When I first got together with this technology, I thought, well, why couldn't we do a 3D scan of somebody's left leg and then mirror that and then just make a 3D printed right leg? It's dramatically more complex than that. And the clinician is the only one who can really make sure that patient outcomes are protected. So whenever you're working with 3D printed parts in biomedical, I really make, want to re recommend that you use a trained certified clinician in the loop. So we've got folks that are uh, kind of in beta right now as we're rolling out the flash fuse technology. Uh, this particular patient, he um, had a congenital limb defect where he was born without the lower half of his right leg. He's since graduated from the prosthetics and orthotics program at Baylor College of Medicine. And his first words to us were, I cannot believe how comfortable this 3D printed prosthetic socket is. We are also entering, today we're entering uh, clinical trials with Baylor College of Medicine to fully validate and flesh out this technology where the 3D scan, 3D print, and 3D workflow will be held up as safe and effective compared to today's conventional mechanical uh, techniques. So a little bit about Ascentium. We started out in 2013, so we're coming up on our fourth birthday. We started out with an injection molding and composites research focus. We did biomaterials and biocomposites for automotive, packaging, and other industries. We, we engaged with the National Science Foundation, had an SBIR uh, award. Uh, and then we decided we needed to start productizing in 3D printing as we started to become aware of the, ma the main problems that were holding 3D printing back, like the delamination issue for FDM. We said we can apply some of our thermoplastic research and begin making the filament and the other materials for FDM. We were awarded a phase two uh, research award for nanocellulose-based composites from the NSF. Again, just hearkening back to our fundamental R&D focus in material science. And in 2016, we began launching our commercial products, which are filament for 3D printing technology. As well, Trifusion Devices was kind of uh, co-founded, myself, my co-founder here today, Brandon Sweeney, and uh, we started that out as an idea and then <laughs> launched the company and then rolled it back into Ascentium so it could grow and have a place to thrive. We've been in the additive space for about a year and a half. Uh, we're working on the next generation of essential materials, again, vertically integrated with manufacturing, analysis, and mechanical design and, and test. Uh, our team was small when it started. Our team's got about 30 people on it now, so we're growing and scaling rapidly. So what's next? We're here today launching our technology and we're opening the order board. We have pre-ordering available now. Two of our OEM partners, Stacker 3D and Aon 3D, are here with us at the show. Come check us out at booth 1313. You can see the technology integrated and we have unit costs below 25K and delivery by the end of this year. So also what we're here to do at this show is to hear more 
from everyone here who's interested in FDM additive. What is it that you'd like to see in the solution? Help us shape it, because we're still in the process where we can put a great degree of shaping into the technology and get it ready for uh, commercial launch. So with that, um, open it up for questions. Uh, thank you all for attending our talk and uh, happy to engage further. Oh, sorry. Could you elaborate a little more on your carbon nanotube uh, wrapping of the filament? Yeah, um, we, we take a carbon nanotube, polymer, nanocomposite mixture, and we have an in-process flow where we fabricate the multi-layer filament. The filament is manufactured to the same quality specs as monofilament today from a diameter and ovality standpoint. Uh, we've printed thousands of hours. We don't have nozzle jams. We don't have any other issues from nanotubes. Sometimes people worry about that. Um, the, the, the outer layers are sufficiently thin so as to flow really, really well in the printer. Um, that keeps costs down and it keeps your cycle time up. Yeah, we are. Feeding that before you go to the printer. You're we're, right? yeah, the we're. Materials are already processed before that's, you print. That is absolutely correct. Yeah, that spool, for example, on the table right there yeah. is multi layer filament, ready to go right into the printer. Any open platform printer can print with our materials, by the way. You can get the electrical property improvements with any printer. That's kind of special. Any open source printer. Mechanical property, you need the welding, but. Okay, following it on to that. The typical printer nozzle, you've got a wider open well area where the melting occurs, followed by a constriction into the nozzle. Mm -hmm. do, do the carbon na nanotubes tend to stay on the surface? Is there a compression? How does that, you, you've got a volumetric change relative to the surface area. We do. So the thin film coating starts out um, you know, at, at a little bit thicker of a coating level with the filament, and it undergoes an extensional flow process in the nozzle. So we see quite a reduction in overall uh, layer thickness in the nozzle, and we've accounted for that. But importantly, we don't see mixing between the outer layer and the inner layer, and that's critically important. Um, you guys might remember I showed a, a cross-sectional view of a little printed part that was very, very fine detail, and you could see that outer coating highly segregated from the inner core. So that's, that's really important. Yeah, a lot of nanomaterial scientists are really concerned with dispersions and so I mean we actually just skip right past that whole problem by making an outer layer and relying on the on the layer uh, itself to do the work for us so good questions uh, you commented on an Intel uh, business model selling chips to computer makers how is your receptivity by the different 3D printing companies to open or other innovation? How do you see that here as a young company so far? Um, great question. Uh, if the printer company is somewhat young, then we tend to get a really, really warm reception. <laughs> We've got, uh, yeah, two launch partners and many, many others that we are in different levels of discussions with on how to bring this technology out to many people, all the way from desktop up to BAM. Uh, for the automotive case study, can you talk about the base matrix polymer that you use? Yeah, in that particular study, it was a uh, polycarbonate carbon fiber. Um, so where we're going next though is PESU carbon fiber. That's our next material out. That's a BASF uh, Ultrason product. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's got a nice highly loaded carbon content and the matrix itself um, has a high melting point uh, which just means that the shot life could extend out into the hundreds of shots which would be great. So. One of your one of your videos uh, in showed some arcing that looked a tremendous amount like the um, like an EDM process in reality. Are you actually um, sending a charge across, or is that just a side effect of an RF function that's generating charge in your surface layer? We are sending a charge across, 
and it is visual and, and you can see it. In fact, you can see it here at and smell it. Um, so you know it's on. And uh, it, has the, it actually has the added benefit of cleaning up VOCs that might come off from the print process. It really is a high voltage, high current density plasma that we're creating in atmospheric air without needing any inert gas blanket and it stays highly localized in the printer. Um, we're quite proud of the solution actually. There's a lot of plasma physics that had to go into that to make that possible. And um, we're excited to be able to roll it out. It's low cost, it's really safe, it's uh, just a wonderful technology. Conduction through the build plate? So yeah, great question. Uh, conduction through the build plate was the question. No, so what we've created is a moving ground plane solution. Because ideally, if you wanted to conduct electricity into the printed part, you'd be worried about resistive losses building up as your part increased in height, and you'd be worried about needing things like a metal build plate or some other you know, gymnastics, basically, to, to make the solution possible. We don't need any of that. You can use PEI you know, sheet uh, as, your, as your build plate surface. You can use build tack. You can use blue painter's tape because we're not conducting into the build plate. We're conducting from the high voltage, high current plasma into the printed part, and we're, and we're grounding out through the nozzle. So the nozzle's completing the circuit. Yep, so just like the filament in an incandescent light bulb completes the circuit and heats up with electrons moving through it, that printed part heats up volumetrically with electrons moving through it because of the high density plasma. A lot of people didn't think that plasma densities could be sufficiently achieved to accomplish this process, but I will tell you, with plasma alone, we can melt plastic. So we're harnessing that. Being an FDM-based process, do you still have issue with like base warpage and um, base adhesion? And then what, what have you guys looked at to dealing with that? Man, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, we actually can relieve stresses in the part also as you're building the part up. So because your heat affected zone is much larger with a plasma-based process, I'm talking 10 to 20x larger than the heat affected zone for just laying down hot plasma, the state of residual stress in the part is much lower because you actually allow annealing to take time to happen in the printed part. These are great questions, y'all. Great questions. Keep it, let's, let, come on, don't hold back. I see some puzzled faces still. I don't want anyone to leave puzzled. Seriously, I want you guys to understand at least a little bit about how this works. Can you elaborate on the ESD applications? Oh, another fantastic question from my dear colleague, Mr. Sweeney. Um, yeah, so the ESD applications are also really very broad. So uh, think about things like uh, packaging for semiconductor applications or PCB boards that need to be packaged and shielded from adjacent circuitry. The fact that we can 3D print a polymer solution that is so much more conductive than any polymers previously mean that you can print packaging without fasteners. You can have new design freedoms to miniaturize the packaging solutions available in a wide range of semiconductor applications. Um, there's also EMI, uh, so electromagnetic interference uh, improvements. Since you can have such a, great, such a great degree of electrical coupling and therefore dissipative loss, you can actually have uh, more EMI possibilities than ever before. So we, we probably have like two, two main groups of customer interest. One is electrical. And one is mechanical. And you know, some are both, but uh, some people are really here because it's, it's an electrical solution for their design that they haven't had in the past. So, so does that open it up to post-process assembly operations like a spot weld or something like that? I don't know about that. Created your parts? Maybe. We'll see. We'll see what our customers do. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're so excited. We're launching now, and we'll see what our customers do. I mean, it's, it's sky's the limit, really. So. All right, great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming to the show. Come see us tonight. We have a launch event. Josh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so there's a launch event tonight at Heinz Field. It's at 8.30. Uh, it is in the uh, PNC Chiefs room. Uh, so you guys are all invited because you came to this talk. So you're all invited. Should be a great time. 8.30 tonight at Heinz Field.
uh, look forward to celebrating with each of you. And there's some uh, more flyers in the back. Uh, Kylan has some as well if you don't have a flyer yet. So. All right, come see us at our booth. Come up and talk to us after this. Thank you all for coming.